I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is February 3rd, 2022. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed, and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take attendance by roll. Chair Hansen present. Uh, Vice Chair Wozowick, Amy. Wozowick present. Lead Heinzman, Josh. Lead Heinzman, Josh. Acom, Patty. Present. Ackland, Susan. Present. Backer, Jeff. Backer, present. Becker, Finn, Jamie. Present. Eklund, Rob. Present. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, present. Green, Steve. Present. Igo, Spencer. Igo, Spencer. Igo, present. Jordan, Sydney. Jordan, present. Keeler, Heather. Keeler, present. Lee, Fu. Lee present. Lippert, Todd. Lippert present. Lewick, Dale. Lewick present. Morrison, Kelly. Morrison present. Nelson, Nathan. Nelson present. Tice, Tama. Tice present. Heinzman, Josh. Present. present. Thank you. Quorum is present. Members, we have uh, several uh, minutes that we have to uh, take action on, starting from last uh, spring, and then we have our interim meetings as well. So we need to take these each as a motion. Uh, it's my understanding we do not have to do a roll call, but each does need a motion. So I'm going to go right from my list and go, uh, Representative Heinz, would you like to move the minutes for April 19th? Yeah, that would be fine. I would make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Heinzman moves the minutes for April 19th, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the minutes are approved. Uh, Representative Wozlowick, would you like to move the minutes for June 23rd, 2021? So moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Wozlowick moves the minutes for June 23rd, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, all those opposed, the minutes are approved. Um, Representative Lewick, would you like to move the minutes of September 14th, 2021? Uh, Mr. Chair, so move. Representative Lewick moves the minutes of for September 14th, 2021. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the minutes are approved. Representative Keeler, would you like to move the minutes for October 27th, 2021? I would move that, Chair. Representative Keeler moves uh, the minutes for October 27th, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the minutes are approved. Representative Fisher, would you like to move the minutes for January 18th, 2022? I will have to pass on that because I was not at that meeting, sir. Gosh, we were going so well. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Representative Tice, would you like to move the minutes for January 18th? I would. So moved. Representative Tice moves the minutes for January 18th, 2022. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it. Minutes are approved. Members and Minnesotans, we have three bills on the calendar today. Uh, we're starting back uh, with actual action uh, for the bills that we're hearing. Uh, I anticipate hearing uh, two or three or four bills uh, each time we meet. Uh, this session. And for the Minnesotans uh, watching, uh, you know, when we have bills, there are there are several types of bills that uh, we're considering. And uh, the first bill we have here today is uh, from Representative Becker Finn. Some of these bills uh, are not coming from an advocacy group. They come from a member. Uh, and they're written by the member with the help of nonpartisan staff based on input we've heard 
other bills like the bill I'll be authoring uh, are the work of, of interest groups and the agencies who've been working on some technical problems and challenges that have vexed uh, us with law for some time and are trying to resolve those. And uh, a bill gets put together as a compromise uh, that is brought here. I'm bringing that bill. And then the third bill, uh, um, I'm trying to make sure we're being bipartisan uh, during this session. Uh, Representative Erdahl has a bill uh, that we had hoped was carried last year, uh, but uh, fell through the cracks and wanna make sure that we are considering that uh, this year is a local bill uh, for him. And when we say a local bill, it affects his district, uh, but also has uh, statewide implications. So there's uh, some of the types of bills that we will be hearing during the session. Um, and I anticipate that will continue. We also have some reports uh, uh, just I'll foreshadow next Tuesday when we get to the end of the uh, of the hearing. So first up, members, we have House File 2764, Representative Becker Finn, Rough Fish Designations Evaluation Report Required. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, would you move that House File 2764 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill? Uh, so moved, Mr. Chair. Representative Becker Finn moves that House File 2764 be laid over for possible inclusion. Representative Becker Finn, uh, to your bill. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the bill before us today is what I am referring to as the no junk fish bill. Uh, so as uh, as mentioned by uh, by the chair. Uh, hopefully folks remember our discussion last year around specifically around gar, which are one species of rough fish in Minnesota. Um, that amendment actually came from members of the public reaching out to me uh, with concerns about the large numbers of gar that were being taken and essentially being wasted after they were uh, killed for sport. And I uh, over the last year uh, and after that GAR discussion last year, I've continued to hear from more Minnesotans and others in support of the efforts around GAR, but also sort of um, people sort of awakening to this uh, awareness of the discrepancies in the law uh, currently in Minnesota regarding rough fish and game fish. And so uh, for folks who are not familiar with our fish regulation handbooks, uh, fish in Minnesota are essentially, fish species in Minnesota are essentially divided into three categories in our state. So game fish um, are uh, like our walleye, uh, our state fish, and um, other things that people pursue for sport and food, things like, uh, you know, northerns and muskies, bass, uh, those types of species are considered game fish. And then we have rough fish, which... Um, <laughs> uh, you know, we have a list of fish that are included as, as rough fish, and um, those include carp, buffalo, sucker, sheep's head, bowfin, gar, gold eye, and bullhead. Uh, so generally, they don't have any limitations on them, and so that's yeah. that's sort of what the yeah. difference is. is that, I just said um, that we'll be at the front door of the building. <laughs> Uh, with that, with that uh, interruption. Uh, so anyway, so we've got we've got game fish, we've got rough fish, of which there are just a couple designated species that are considered rough fish, and then kind of every other kind of fish uh, falls into the category of other. Um, and those mostly are things that people don't catch or uh, take in any way. They're smaller species and things that um, typically don't concern humans uh, as much. And so there's no scientific distinction um, in the, the basis for what makes a rough fish or a game fish. And in, in fact, things have really changed over time. And so I have behind me, I am, I'm not, um, not being paid anything. Um, I just really love the great Minnesota fish book. It's one of the favorite books in my household. A uh, lot of great information. And as, as that book lays out, it's a Minnesota Historical Society book. Um, as crazy as Minnesotans are for walleyes today, during the state's early years, no one paid the fish much heed. In its first annual reports of the late 1870s, uh, the Minnesota Fish Commission hardly mentions walleyes other than to lump them with bass and other fish uh, that might be propagated down the road. So, you know, there really isn't a scientific reason of why things end up in one category or the other. And I think our testifiers are gonna share more about that. So really the practical difference for us and our constituents is that there are limits on how many game fish uh, a person can take. You know, we're all familiar with that. Um, 
a couple of weeks ago, I was up at the Lake of the Woods uh, after walleye and, uh, you know, we're all used to looking in the booklet and kind of looking up, depending upon what lake you're on, um, how many fish you can take. And that, you know, that's based on science that's, and it changes, it can change year to year based on the populations and um, the research that the DNR does and making sure that we're not overtaking, um, you know, taking too much of any of our fish as a resource. And so um, rough fish and other fish are not protected in that way. There are really no limits and, uh, there's really not a lot being done to make sure that we're not taking more from the ecosystem, taking more um, than should be taken. So uh, I'll turn it over to my testifiers now. Um, I'm obviously not a scientist. Um, I'm an angler and uh, a parent of uh, anglers as well. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to my first testifier uh, to say more about, uh, about this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Solomon David, if you could introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you very much. My name is Solomon David, and I'm an assistant professor of biological sciences at Nichols State University in Louisiana. Uh, is it possible to uh, share my screen for a couple of quick images there? All right, I'm going to switch to that really quickly. I'm just coming in up. <clears throat> okay, what I wanted to quickly just share to reiterate uh, Representative uh, Becker Finn's uh, uh, start on this bill is that uh, rough fish really don't have any scientific uh, basis. Uh, this terminology actually uh, arose around the 1800s when uh, boats had to move large amounts of fish. Some of them were uh, considered to be more valuable and they were fully processed. So they're considered to be dressed fish, whereas fish that were not as valuable, they did not have the, uh, they were not filleted and uh, processed the same way. They were considered to be rough dressed fish. And uh, as boats had to move, large amounts of fish through shallow waters during hot days, they oftentimes uh, discarded those rough dressed fish. So we believe this to be the origin um, of that rough fish uh, terminology. It was later adopted by fisheries biologists um, in terms of uh, native fishes that they believe were harming preferred game fish populations. Um, since then, the science does not support this. So that has been uh, um, disregarded over time, but it's taken time to sort of move away from this rough fish designation. The image I wanted to show you all here is of three native species. One of them is the bowfin, the other one's the long-nosed gar, and the other one is the largemouth bass, a ubiquitous uh, game fish species. But I wanted to reiterate that these are human constructs. These three species are native species that have important roles to play in their native ecosystems. I want, wanted to point out a lack of fisheries management for rough fishes. Some of these images here show uh, buffalo fish that's oftentimes the target of uh, bow fishers. Here we have a scene from Oklahoma where bow fishers shot over 1,000 uh, gars and just simply threw them back into the water. So we looked at regulations in a recent paper that I was co-author of and found that throughout the United States, there's either unlimited or practically unlimited harvest regulations for a lot of these rough fishes the suckers, the bowfin, the gars, and the buffalo. And these are long-lived species. Not only do we have a lack of regulations, we have a lack of research on these fishes. What I'm showing here is the game fishes, your typical salmon and trout, yellow perch and walleye. We reviewed papers put out by the American Fishery Society, the oldest and largest fisheries organization in the world. And we looked at all of the papers they put out. Uh, game fishes received 11 times more research than rough fishes like our suckers, catfishes, and gars. There are a couple fishes that we consider to be rough fish escapees who have had somewhat of an improved uh, reputation over the past um, several years. An example being the uh, alligator gar. There were still five times more papers um, and research done on those game fish relative to these escapees. So we have a human construct which doesn't have any scientific basis. We have a lack of regulation across most of the 50 states, and we have a lack of research information, including uh, Minnesota. And speaking with the DNR, there's a dearth of information on these species, and so I would strongly support. Uh, the need for research to be done to find out, do we need regulations on some of these fishes or are some of these populations okay? And with that, I will uh, 
turn it back over to uh, Representative Becker Fent. Representative Becker Fent, let's go through the uh, um, each of the testifiers and then we'll open up for questions. Tyler Winter. Yes. Um, good afternoon, Chair Hansen and committee members. Uh, my name is Tyler Winter. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today in favor of House File 2764. For the last 20 years, I've been advocating for Minnesota's native fish. In that time, I have caught 50 species of Minnesota's fish and appeared in a few fishing shows. I'm a proud member of the Isaac Walton League and a rod and gun conservationist. I believe that managed hunting and fishing creates stakeholders who are dependent on the resource. No one who enjoys pursuing native fish should want them eliminated, which is why rod and gun conservation seeks a balance between utilization and protection. Without utilization, there are no stakeholders. And without protections, there are no resources. Last summer, I filmed a fishing show for the Meteor Network. We targeted river and shorthead red horse. And we address this balance by discussing the rarity of river red horse and the edibility of shorthead red horse. However, there is no balance in Minnesota's fishing regulations. Native non-game fish are effectively unmanaged until they receive a conservation designation. Either or management creates confusion, resentment, non-compliance, and erodes manager credibility. Most insidiously, it also minimizes the number of advocates. Unmanaged species are seen as too common to warrant attention, and designated species are off limits to sportsmen. This effect is magnified for fish, which are effectively invisible until they're caught. Most anglers aren't actually even aware that there are 26 species of native rough fish to Minnesota. The Minnesota chapter of the Isaac Walton League has just passed a resolution supporting management of our native non-game fish, all sports people especially those who utilize rough fish, should support this bill. It is the first step towards balanced and coherent management of, our, of Minnesota's native fish. Thank you again for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as long as they're not where my specific fishing locations are. Thank you, Mr. Winter. Uh, next, we'll hear from the DNR, uh, Brad Parsons, DNR Fish and Wildlife fisheries manager. Welcome. Yes, um, my name is Brad Parsons, section of fisheries manager for the Division of Fish and Wildlife, Minnesota DNR. Um, in, in the interest of full disclosure, and maybe this is kind of funny, um, I met Dr. David this morning. Uh, we had set up a call to talk about management of GAR, uh, which the legislature has directed us to do. And so I had no idea he was testifying today until this morning. And, and uh, Mr. Winter, I have uh, corresponded with him. He's been um, a, a very strong advocate for our native fishes. And I would like to put forward that so has the department recently anyway. Um, we, in the last several years, we have removed uh, fish from the rough fish list, uh, American eel, uh, burbot, most people know it as eel pout. Um, Northern Cisco, most people know it as tulipy, and whitefish. So we we are we are concerned about these things, and there has been new science that has come in. Uh, there's no question about that. Some of the uh, ways that that apparently big mouth buffalo can live to extraordinary ages are things that we have never heard before, and we're in the midst of processing that. I will also add that um, our fisheries budget is supported in great, in a great amount by the Sport Fish Restoration Act or Dingle Johnson, Pittman Robertson. So uh, what we have been able to do in the past has been somewhat limited by that because we need that federal reimbursement and we can't work on things like that. I, I will say, there is a uh, national effort that's uh, bubbling up to say that, you know, with things like bow fishing, um, species that we have not looked at in the past are actually sport fish. And I tend to agree with that. And the department tends to agree with that. Um, you know, we, we are very supportive of this concept. Uh, when I've had this, I've had this job for a little over three years now. 
And that is one of the things I really wanted to do when I moved into this position was to raise the awareness and the value of native species. These are not invade everything that is not a walleye or a sunfish is not a carp. So, and, and unfortunately that is some of what is out there. These, these are valuable native species and, and I get that. Um, we, we have been talking within the department over the last couple of years. Personally, I hate the term rough fish and Dr. David, thank you. I didn't even know where that term came from. Thanks for enlightening me today. Um, I, I don't like that term. And, and we really do need to reclassify things. The important thing to remember in regard to this bill is that we have a vital commercial fishing operation in Minnesota where uh, species like carp and buffalo are harvested for um, human consumption. Uh, it's an important um, livelihood for many Minnesotans. Unfortunately, I, I wish I could pull it off the top of my head, but I do not know the number of commercial fishermen we have, but it, it, th these fish are good to eat um, and, and they are saleable. And in many places, they are in numbers that commercial fishing is a very viable opportunity. We also understand that bow fishing is an incredibly um, attractive sport and it has brought many people in. And, you know, Tyler mentioned that, and, and I have reached out to the bow fishing community, but one of the things we also have to look at here is uh, we, need, we need some outreach with the commercial fishing community, and we need the outreach with the bow fishing community. We have started that process, um, but there is a lot to do there. Um, one of the things that we talked with Dr. David about this morning was our lack of, of biology on these fish. I alluded to that earlier. Um, I really, I, I learned more this morning about gar than, than I've learned in 35 years as a fishery scientist. Uh, and one whose, frankly, interest was piqued in being coming a fisheries biologist by having a, a very large long nose gar come up behind my bobber on a lake in Wisconsin. So I, I respect these fish, I truly do. And, and the department does as well. And we're very interested in this. Um, we, we, can, we could provide um, some preliminary information by October as this bill speaks about. However, we don't have a great deal of science. We are doing way better, honestly, than a lot of other states on non-game fish science. And a lot of that is due to uh, the Environment Natural Resources Trust Fund, which funded our early invasive carp work. And with that, because we had so few invasive carp, and because my colleagues in other states said, we wish we had more information on fish like buffalo and paddlefish and freshwater drum, et cetera, before the invasion, we have more of that than a lot of people do, a lot of other states do. And I'm proud of that. But to put something based on science on some of these species that we know so little about is, is tricky. And that's why you know I, I'm happy to provide something by that date. Um, I just don't know exactly what we're being asked to do. And I, I know uh, Representative Becker Finn had a discussion with my director yesterday about this. I, I, I love this concept, I honestly do. Um, I'm uh, Mr. Winner is a, a great advocate. We have dozens of other people like him around the state fishing for for species that aren't necessarily a walleye or a pike or a bass is great, and I I fully support the concept. I'm honestly still a little confused about the implementation, but but that is something that I believe we can work very closely together with this committee in order to. Um, implement. Representative Becker Finn, why don't you give some legislative intent? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Hansen. Uh, for the record, uh, you know, this is not, um, this bill on its own is not meant to be an end all be all solution to sort of the conundrum and the things that we're all acknowledging in this uh, in this meeting today. This is uh, to get the ball rolling and sort of 
start the process of, of laying out exactly officially in uh, state documents from the DNR of what is needed, you know, and at least in my years of service, I've never had, we've never had an ask for funding to do more research. We certainly have um, the, the students and the resources available through the University of Minnesota. And, um, you know, this, the idea here is that we want the, to keep this conversation going and we need the DNR to be an active part of it. And what I heard um, talking to Mr. Ofeld yesterday and with your testimony today is that that's something you're willing to do. And if there are ways uh, for us to fine tune the bill to make it more specific, uh, that that's absolutely fine. I'm a big believer in the legislative process as there's a reason that we do it this way so that we can get feedback and we can make things better. Um, so the, the intent is not that you're going to come out with some proposed regulations immediately on exactly how what number you, of fish you can harvest of any of these species. The idea is that we find out what it is that we need. Um, if we need research, if, uh, you know, you do the research and you figure out that, you know, we now can establish that there's really no scientific reason to make the distinction between these species, then, then let's keep having that conversation and come back um, next year and keep moving forward on this issue in a really careful and intentional way that's based in science. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to clarify that. Mr. Parsons, does that help? Yes, ab absolutely, it does. I mean, again, we I, I truly believe that uh, Representative Becker Finn and the other testifiers and I are all on the same page here as the department is. And, uh, you know, we it's 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 so hard when you're talking about about social science versus fishery science. Um, I, I think there's a lot of fishery science here. I, I you know, I really personally viscerally don't care for the term rough fish because it does it does you know in essence say these fish aren't worth as much as something else and we've we've done this through pushing from people like Mr. Winter uh, we we put things in the regulations book about you know if you catch this fish and you're not going to utilize it put it back in the water it's a native animal it it has a place in the ecosystem and yep there there it is thank you um, and I'm proud of that. And, and there are, are uh, communities that, that utilize fish that a lot of other people don't do. And I think that's wonderful as well. And they, they should be. Um, again, the, the outreach we're going to have to have with the commercial fishing community and the bow fishing community is very, very important. And it, it has started, um, but it, it's going to take a little bit more time. But again, I, I truly believe we're all on the same page here. And Mr. Parsons, I think uh, also uh, outreach with the tribal communities would be important with that outreach as well. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. We have four hands so far. So I'm gonna go with Representative Green, Representative Lewick, Representative Jordan, and then Representative Heinzman. So Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the testifier. <clears throat> Uh, listening to this, when I first read the bill, I wasn't really um, aware of exactly what you're trying to accomplish. So I'm, I appreciate the explanation, but uh, it sounds to me like the bill's kind of jumping the gun, and, and Mr. Parsons can jump in if he wants. But uh, it looks like we're going to be putting uh, a mandate onto the agency, uh, and I don't see any funding in here. And, and furthermore, it sounds like the, the science may not even be available yet. And so uh, my concern is that if this does go through, we're going to have we're going to see these agencies coming back at us, uh, saying that now that we uh, now that we've passed a law demanding that they perform an act, that we're going to have to start looking into the budget for funding for that, uh, as well as maybe some rulemaking. So I think uh, it sounds like they're already doing this, and as, as these different species come up. Uh, listening to Mr. Parsons, it sounds like they're taking care of it as they're coming forward, which might be the proper way to do it. It doesn't sound like they've been sitting back and doing nothing, and I appreciate that. So perhaps we're probably just jumping the gun a little bit on this bill. And Representative Green, we're, we're holding the bill over. Uh, we are a finance committee. I anticipate there will be a fiscal note uh, 
there appears to be some uh, some funds available. So uh, we uh, will be anticipating that and looking at when we prepare the bill, uh, what the cost is for the writing the report. Uh, Representative Becker Finn to uh, Representative Green. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And, uh, you know, I think this is asking the DNR to do additional a little bit more on this issue. Uh, I do appreciate that, you know, it seems like they're on the right track already. And again, just would emphasize your point that this is being laid over and um, also open if folks want to meet outside of committee to work on improving the bill. I'm always happy to do that. Representative Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, I think I've, you know, I've, I've made my comments, but we'll just, with the four more questions or more, we probably better move on. Uh, Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, yeah, interesting subject here. And uh, uh, good to see uh, Mr. Parsons. We miss him up in my part of the world, uh, around Mille Lacs Lake. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I got a couple comments here. One, uh, uh, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I tended the smokehouse for uh, for red horse and and uh, white fish, uh, and I had a great uncle that drove all the way from Chicago to spend two weeks fishing for bullheads right in the lake next door to me. Uh, so uh, that uh, people discount those kind of fish from a commercial or an eating basis, uh, uh, mostly due to lack of education. Here's my concern about if we start tasking the DNR directly with funding, uh, I see this as a uh, subject that's really ripe for LCCMR uh, work. Uh, and so I would be cautious about putting dollars directly to the DNR to start this route, uh, because then we get into the argument about, okay, we can't be duplicating what the legislature has already funded over in the LCCMR world. Uh, but to me, this this looks like uh, absolutely uh, one of the base uh, uh, functions that the LCCMR funding should be looking at. And I would ask the DNR uh, right away to start looking at outlining the kind of science they need, or they would, you know, to 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 help them uh, better deal with this. So that's just some general comments. And again, uh, uh, hats off to Mr. Parsons. I uh, say uh, we. We've uh, sat in the same room a lot of times and discussed Mille Lacs Lake stuff. Uh, but that, that's to say, this makes sense, but don't get ahead of ourselves here and complicate some hard science look in the LCCMR world. Uh, uh, so, so uh, you know, that's, uh, that's my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Becker Finn to Representative Lewick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I, I think Representative Lewick and I might actually be on the same page, um, even if uh, he doesn't realize it. Uh, but I, I think one of the reasons that this is asking for a report is so that we can assess what is actually needed. So I mean, that that was a choice on my part to not direct them to do the research off the bat. Um, but, you know, take this in a really intentional um, manner so that we can see what is actually needed. And um, would love from someone from the U of M or someone else uh, to apply for LCCMR funds uh, in the future to do more around fish that aren't uh, walleye and uh, our game, game fish species. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Lewis, respond. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's uh, very important that we don't complicate the LCCMR process, uh, but to trigger other folks that legitimately do that hard science research to be looking at that, that's a, that'd be a good thing. I'd like to give uh, Mr. Winter a chance to uh, reply and then uh, back to Representative Jordan. Mr. Winter. I think it's important to note that the Minnesota fishing regulations are in large part social science, that the, um, because it's an open access fishery, it's, it's really difficult to actually control harvest. And so the fishing regulations serve as a, a very important educational tool for the public. The most common question I get when I catch a red horse, like in a park, right, is, is that a carp? And then I have to go like through this whole spiel about, no, it's not a carp. And there's actually, we have six species of red horse in Minnesota. And, you know, like this one's a shorthead red horse and, and so on and so forth, because the fishing regulations just say rough fish 
the season is continuous and the uh, limit is unlimited. And so we have all of these native fish that are largely underutilized and unknown simply because the, the place people go to get information about fish in the fishing regulations does not list them, right? And so when I take people fishing, they're thrilled to catch a bunch of big fish. If we use the fishing regulations to help educate the public about these fish, it could help like angler recruitment. You know, people stop fishing because they don't catch anything. Um, but if they knew the opportunities that were out there and how much fun it is to, to catch a, a red horse or a buffalo or a bowfin, I think we'd, we'd see benefits from a social aspect that we don't actually need a lot of hard biological data to justify ethical, responsible, sustainable like harvest, like that is educating people. Thank you. Representative Lord. Oh, that's that's fine. I I uh, need to get though. I will just make a comment. Uh, I heard Mr. Parsons ma mention a couple times about the science, and. Uh, uh, so uh, again, uh, let's start with basic science uh, and we can build from there. Uh, and I say, I would ask everybody that's looking for a project to start exploring uh, what's already available. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And actually, uh, Representative Lewick set me up pretty nicely there. I was going to ask about the science of um, fish and some of our non-game species and the effects that they have on our ecosystem. I mean, it's it's funny when Mr. Winter was talking, I was thinking of all the times that I accidentally caught a, a buffalo or a sheephead and thought, what on earth did, is this? This is not a walleye. Um, and it's, it's they're usually pretty fun fish to catch. Um, so I was hoping um, that Dr. David could talk a little bit about the science of um, our ecosystem management and the roles that some of these non-typical fish play in our um, wetlands and ecosystems. And I also think it's important for us to remember how they connect with other iconic Minnesota species beyond um, angling. So I know we, we, we care a lot about our loons um, and our eagles and of course our walleye. So um, Dr. David, I don't know if you can talk a little bit about the role that all of these fish play in our ecosystem and what the science is that tells us about needing to protect them. Dr. David. Thanks, those are great questions. And uh, that's um, science that uh, my lab's been working on. I've been focusing on this with native and, you know, quote unquote rough fish species for over 22 years, um, ranging from the Great Lakes and the Midwest all the way down to Louisiana. So what we found is that no matter what ecosystem they're in, a lot of these fish like bowfin and gar serve as apex predators. They help maintain balance within ecosystems, much like thinking about wolves in Yellowstone or in a given system. So they can actually prevent stunting from panfish or even you know, other types of uh, more popular game fish. Uh, we also look at their ecological roles um, in food webs and also in nutrient cycling. Um, there's actually large carbon stores with suckers as they move uh, into tributaries, much like salmon in the Pacific Northwest, moving nutrients and sort of helping to uh, um, foster growth in a given aquatic ecosystem. So there's a lot of factors where they contribute to native ecosystems, even if they don't traditionally have the value to sort of the traditional fisheries management that, uh, that we've been sort of doing for, for decades. So the times are changing for that. Um, and to get at some of the previous questions, um, I was part of the team that looked at this uh, rough fish designation nationally. And so we've identified the knowledge gaps. We've identified how that sort of tipped the scales more towards uh, these more popular game fishes. So in speaking with um, uh, Brad Parsons and others in Minnesota DNR earlier today, we're very uh, eager to help them identify those knowledge gaps. And so I think it doesn't, it's not so much that the hard science needs to be done. That exists in other places that we can contribute to a report. It's identifying what are the gaps in knowledge in Minnesota that we can therefore task um, other scientists, other agencies to look into those gaps. And so luckily we've got a lot of basis for that science there, but uh, the take home message is they do perform valuable ecosystem services 
And when you're talking about other organisms, they're indicators of good ecosystem health and ecosystem function. Therefore, if you find healthy populations of gars, bofins, and buffalo, that's usually going to be healthy habitats for your loons and for your other game species. Um, they serve as hosts for freshwater mussels, which are great uh, indicator species. So wide applications of the value of these native species. Sam Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think Dr. David um, answered a lot of my questions, but I did want to let him know that I am a huge fan of his Twitter feed and I follow him in the Gar Lab on Twitter and I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you how much that means to me. So thank you for being here and thank you for all your work on behalf of our fish. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm just gonna warn everybody, I'm gonna be a bit grouchy. Um, we've just spent 40 minutes on a bill that isn't ready. Uh, there's a reason that this hasn't gone to the LCCMR, and I would suspect after six years serving there, it probably wouldn't get support there. There's a reason it's here in this committee, and that's probably because we could force it potentially. And even though it's got a long ways to go, we've spent a, a very large amount of time on something that we easily could have placed as a, a bill or something that has a high priority. And we're going to be coming to uh, a point shortly when. Testimony will probably be tightening up and we'll have less time to discuss issues that are super important in this committee, not to be completely obnoxious, but I'm a little frustrated. Um, I'm hope that, hoping that more legislation, more bills can come uh, that are a high priority and ready to go, Mr. Chair. And um, the questions that came from DNR, I think are really critical. Clearly there's questions about the, the financing of how this would actually move forward, um, the implementation and the timelines. So. Uh, just trying to make sure, Mr. Chair, that uh, our time is well spent going forward, and and I hope maybe another time you might be able to give me the same message if if uh, things aren't always the same. So um, I'll do my best to uh, uh, keep us on track and uh, to pull my time um, and move forward. Now we can, I suppose, move on to the next bill. But um, that's my comment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Heinzman. You know the beautiful thing about the legislative process is when there are questions and input, it happens uh, in front of the public and that uh, you members can put forward bills and you build the bill in the committee. I know that that is sometimes not uh, a common practice, but it is a good practice. And so Representative Becker Finn has, has this bill here. We've had great testimony. I thought some very good questions. And you know, often we run into a chicken or egg question. Well, this shouldn't be done here, it should be there. It shouldn't be done here, it should be there. It should be there, it shouldn't be here. And then what happens is process bogs down the product. So I think we've had a good step. I take into account your, uh, uh, your input, um, but this is how the, how the system is supposed to work. And I'm sure we're going to hear from the general public and our constituents on bills, not only this one, but other ones as we move forward. We do have the ability to multitask and we have the ability to take issues uh, one after the other. So, um, you know, I understand what you're saying. It's the first day of our committees and this is the first bill. So, um, Representative Heinzman, then I see Mr. Parsons and Representative Becker Finn have a comment. Representative Heitzman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, think I, I think I covered it and I appreciate your response. Um, just looking for some, uh, hopefully uh, less bill making in this committee and, and, and more discussion of the actual business that needs to get done. But I understand your perspective, thank you. And I look forward to some bipartisan support, uh, perhaps on the next bill. Um, uh, Mr. Parsons. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Heintzman, your, your comments are, are, are well taken. Um, again, I certainly need to reiterate that, that the department is fully supportive of the concept of this, elevating the um, our native species and making sure that just because it's not a walleye or a bass, that it's, that it's not it's not worth our time. And I, that I, again, I, I can't reiterate more. It's almost, almost a personal 
thing for me, and I know it is for very, very many other people. And we will we will work very hard to make sure that that the concept of this uh, moves forward. Representative Becker Finn. Uh, just ready to close us out if you're ready, Mr. Chair. I am ready. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, House Bill 2764, folks have actually looked at the bill. It, it's a report. It's not meant to be every solution to this complicated and interesting um, place that we find ourselves in uh, in 2022 when it comes to to fish. And so, uh, just want to remind folks that it's it's a board it's a it's a bill that sets up a report. Um, and you know, one of the great things about being a chair is that you can also uh, choose to lift up different issues that are important to Minnesotans, even if it maybe isn't uh, something that's in the headlines. And so I just want to thank you, Mr. Chair, um, for lifting up this issue, because I know that I hear about this. It's the number of times someone has randomly come up to me and been like, you know, that thing about GAR? That really was a cool hearing. I really appreciated that. And so I think, you know, the connecting with Minnesotans and how they see our natural world and the species that are our natural resources is, is really a good thing. And so um, we'll just close by saying that, you know, I think all creatures, great and small, have a role in our ecosystem, regardless of uh, the value placed on them in a capitalist system. Uh, you know, every single one of these living beings does have value because it is part of a greater ecosystem and part of that web. And I think regardless of your, your spiritual or cultural beliefs, those of us who, who hunt and fish, you know, there's an ethic that goes with that as uh, we conserve and see ourselves as conservationists. And so I uh, would really appreciate folks' support for the no junk fish bill and would renew my motion that this uh, bill be laid over for possible inclusion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our testifiers. Representative Becker Finn renews her motion that House File 2764 to be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. And Minnesotans, what that means is it's going to be worked on. So if you have an input or any ideas, contact uh, Representative Becker Finn. Uh, next up, I'm going to turn the gavel, or in this case, the hockey puck, over to uh, uh, Vice Chair Wozlowick uh, as I have the next bill up. So Vice Chair Wozlowick. All right, next up on the agenda is House File 2819. Representative Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I will move that House File 2819 be recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Representative Hansen uh, moves that House File 2819 be recommended to be re-referred to Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. Um, Representative Hansen, would you like to briefly explain the bill and then we'll get to your testifiers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the issue of trespass, uh, has been a, a concern with uh, outdoor recreation for a long time. And this bill uh, relates to civil penalties uh, regarding snowmobiles. And uh, as with many complex things, uh, it has involved a lot of work. And uh, the interests that have been involved in that work have worked with the agency and have uh, drafted this bill, which I am authoring. Uh, and so that is House File uh, 2819, it is a hope that this will uh, help resolve issues related to snowmobile trespassing uh, and clarify some of the responsibilities. And I have with me uh, first uh, today, Doug Franson with the Minnesota United Snowmobilers Association. Mr. Franson, if you could just introduce yourself for the record and then provide your testimony. Uh, thank you. My name is Doug Franson and I am representing the Minnesota United Snowmobilers today. Uh, as I was watching the first bill, oh, and I'm coming to you from beautiful Cragen's Resort in um, East Gull Lake, Minnesota, and it's a beautiful day here. And I was thinking, I'll be spending the next four days outside. And upon reflection, Minnesota, and I'm not the only one, and snowmobiling is not the only sport outside. Minnesotans are a strange and wonderful breed. We think it's well, it's only five below zero. So let's go spend the day outside. Try to explain that to someone from Florida. You just can't. But uh, we are truly blessed as Minnesotans to have the resources we are and to use them responsibly. 
Um, uh, uh, I'm sure I, I may be repetitive for some of you, but Minnesota has over uh, 22,000 miles of snowmobile trails and approximately 900 to 1,000, give or take, are what we call state trails. The rest are what we call grant and aid trails developed and maintained by snowmobile clubs with oversight from local units of government. And under our law, landowners throughout the state uh, permit public access to their land for recreation, for, for snowmobile recreation and uh, any other recreation if you have that permission. Uh, and you don't have to be a member of Men USA to enjoy Minnesota snowmobile trails. I will say it's a pretty good idea. And if anyone wants to email me after, I can facilitate the transaction. Um, we have a problem in Minnesota. And there is also a problem in the snow belt nationwide. And that's an increase in trespass. People taking their machines off the trail, off that portion of the land that the landowner has granted us permission and uh, kind of going all over the land. Um, landowners don't like trespass. And without our landowners, at least 20,000 miles of those 22,000 miles disappear. Uh, they are doing a public service and we want to do everything to support them. In fact, we want to do everything we can to support a safe and responsible culture of snowmobiling and other outdoor recreation. As Chairman Hansen has said, we've worked with other motorized groups. We've worked with the DNR and our work product is uh, before you. It's pretty straightforward. It simply increases the fines for trespass. Uh, because what we have found, and there will be testimony to this effect, is that the current fi fine structure does not deter trespass. And um, I do want to say for a lot of landowners, the trespass, trespass is a very, very serious problem, uh, be it by ATV, snowmobile, OHV, whatever, particularly if they planted a for example, a winter wheat crop. A lot of times these, are, these machines are capable of tearing that up. Uh, and what we think is we tried to find something that would really catch the trespassers attention. People trespass for two reasons. Um, one, and I think this is the dominant reason, they don't know any better. And we, we in the DNR uh, spend a lot of time and money doing public education on that. And there are other s folks that really don't care. They're selfish, they're thoughtless. Uh, they understand the consequences and they don't really care. We're simply uh, addressing that second group, hoping that we can get them to care. Um, we, we think it's a great idea. We think it's critically important. Uh, it, it's one tool in our toolbox for to promote and ensure responsible snowmobiling throughout Minnesota. And uh, with that, it's not a tremendous fine, but after frankly years of discussion, it came down on increasing uh, the fines for first offense for from hundred dollars to two fifty, or is it 50? fifty? Yeah, it was fifty to two hundred and fifty. The second offense would be um, five hundred dollars, and the third offense would be a thousand dollars. If that sounds draconian to you, I will tell you our membership thought, think it's too modest, but I think it's the right thing. We have a number of people say take away their snowmobile at that point. Um, and I think we do have uh, Colonel Smith from the DNR to talk about uh, how they would enforce the law and the department's position. But I also have with me the chair of our legislative uh, committee, and I believe he has signed up. And if it's all right, I'll just pass my computer to the next 
uh, chair, and he will give you a real life example of the problem we're trying to fix. And Thanks. is this is this <clears throat> Terry Hutchinson? Yes. Okay. Yep. He's on the list. So, Mr. Hutchinson, if you can introduce yourself for the record, so we know who you are, and then you can start your testimony. Ready. Thank you. My name is Terry Hutchinson. I live in the Southwest Prior Lake area of the state. Um, been doing legislative chairman for not Two. as long as Doug, but almost. Um, but just an example in my county where I live, about three years ago, our sheriff had five trespassers written up because they were out in a farmer's field. They actually went around his house and come back to the road. And the fine is $50. So one of them pulled out a $100 bill and tried to give it to the sheriff and say, can you just take care of this for me when you go back and just keep the change? So, I mean, that's a clear example of what they think of $50. It's nothing. Um, so then after that, we worked with our county attorney and we presently charge $200 now. It's a misdemeanor and you can pick what you want. So we're charging $200 now in our county, ends up about $280. And, I would say we've gotten rid of 60 to 70% of the trespassers. So increasing the fines work and we've got all four groups with us that want to do that. So yeah. otherwise that's all I have to add. Thank yeah. you. And, and Madam Chair, the four Thank group, Doug, Fran, Doug Franzen, yeah. again, the four groups we're talking about are uh, the motorized recreation, AT, ATV Minnesota, Minnesota United Snowmobile Association, uh, the off-road truckers and who's the fourth? And the motorcycles. And the motorcycle off folks, off-road motorcycles. Off motorcycles. And, and thank you, we stand united in our support for this needed, important, and hopefully non-controversial legislation. Thank you, Mr. Franson and Mr. Hutchinson. I see Representative Hanson, you've unmuted. Did you have something you wanted to add real quick or go on to next testifier? Just wanted to thank them for their advocacy and uh, you know the challenge of of trying to uh, put together compromise effort and um, you know obviously some people think this is too much some people think it's not enough but it's important we we take some action and I hope we can uh, move this out of committee with strong support I think Representative Eklund has a question Representative Eklund um, is your question can we take that now or do you should we do the last testifier I think we'll do Testifier first, and then we'll take your question if that's okay, Representative Eklund. All right, next up we have uh, Colonel Rodman Smith. Um, Colonel, if you can introduce yourself for the record and then provide your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colonel Rodman Smith, Director of Enforcement, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, first I just want to start off by saying that, you know, the members, the members of Min USA, ATV Association, Minnesota, off highway motorcycle, four wheel drive, the members are the ones that want to bring this forward. And it just goes to show the tremendous stewardship and the value they place on the cooperation they have with private landowners. As uh, Mr. Franzen said, there's over 22,000 miles of snowmobile trails in the state of Minnesota. I think that's more than state highway miles. Um, we have about 180 conservation officers at any given time. Uh, to patrol that so it is difficult um, to to catch people in the act when they are trespassing um, we we the civil citation uh, authority is going to give our officers another tool in their tool belt because then they can also bring forward some restitution um, if there is damage that that occurs like mr franzen said on some on some crops and so i'll keep it short and i'll just say uh, the department support system we appreciate the member groups bringing this forward and ensuring and answer making this forward. Thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Um, we will move to questions now. So I saw uh, Representative Eklund's hand. So we'll go to you, Representative Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, this isn't a question. This is a, a this is a comment. Um, I, I I'm proud to be a co-author on this legislation. Uh, when I have to see my local ATV groups and local snowmobile groups have to put out social media and take out advertising every every day please stay on or every year at the start of the seasons please stay on the trails because landowners are granting us easement we, it, it's about time that we do something that's gonna uh take care of uh i'll 
guess I'll call you this, call them the slob riders of the world that don't like to play by the rules. So thank you, Representative Hansen, for this, uh, this legislation. And Doug, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. My apologies, I actually did miss uh, another person who's on our list to testify. So we'll go back to uh, Ron Potter and then um, we'll take further questions after Mr. Potter is done. Mr. Potter, if you can just identify yourself for the record and then proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, my name is Ron Potter. I am the president of ATV Association of Minnesota. And we just wanna voice our support of this, this bill. Um, like the Snow Hill Association, we have a lot of our trails on private land. We rely on those landowners to give us permission. Typically that's a one year permit for no fee. And in exchange, they expect our riders to stay on the trail. So trespass is certainly a big issue. And in this day and age with technology the way it is, there's no way for people not to know where they're at if they wanna know where they're at. So um, I, we strongly support this, this change. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Potter. Um, and I see Representative Heinzman has his hand up. Representative Heinzman. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a brief comment. It's a good bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Hansen, for bringing this forward. Let's uh, go ahead and vote on it and uh, get it moving. It needs to become law. Um, typically, if these sorts of enhancements to trespassing statute are moving forward and it doesn't negatively impact trappers, you're going to get a lot of support from, from my members. So uh, let's go. Sounds good. Thank you, Representative Heinzman. Uh, I see Representative Green has his hand up as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for me, I just clarification that the, the bill is really loaded down with statutes and I tried looking them up and it looks like most of the statutes are uh, for public lands uh, as I'm looking them up. Um, and I think that right now, uh, mm -hmm. private lands are, are already, well, ag land is already, uh, Classified, you can be you can be charged with trespassing for going on ag, ag land, but if there uh, if it's not ag land and not posted, then then there's no charge. And so I'm wondering if in these statutes in this, to, this is for the the bill author, if uh, what exactly does it address as far as the private versus public lands? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. If you look on uh, 1.18, uh, Representative Green, it said a civil citation under first paragraph shall require restitution for public and private property damage and impose a penalty. So you've got civil authority, uh, which will be discussed in Chair Becker Finn's committee, uh, and then the penalties as well. The citations, uh, the statutory citations above that uh, talked on existing uh, statutes we're dealing here is with the increasing the penalties on the first offense and uh, Again, then you go farther down and uh, allocating the penalty upon accounts where that goes. So uh, Colonel Smith, if you, uh, if I am in error there, if you wanna add to that, that would be helpful. Uh, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. Madam Chair uh, uh, and Chair Hanson and, and Representative Green, the other thing this does is it does add that snowmobiles can be uh, given civil citations. And so prior to this, we couldn't issue a, a civil citation to a snowmobile in violation. So um, there looks like a few strikeouts here, uh, like line 1.10, 1 1.12, 1.14. They just add 84.90 down um, to line 117. And so um, it, that's really the big change here. They're just moving around a couple statutes, adding snowmobile and increasing the fine and then where the receipts go. Representative Green, did that answer your question or do you have a uh, Well, I think that I'm just going to do more digging. I probably won't vote for the bill today until I get get some more clarification as to uh, maybe some of the issues that uh, Representative Heinzman brought up as far as uh, if it's going to spill over and affect trapping or not, but um, and dig more into the into the statutes. It's always tough to try to get through those statutes, especially when you're not here where you're supposed to be and this thing is really loaded down. And so no, that will do it for now. Thanks. All right, any further discussion? I'm not seeing any hands. Representative Hansen, did you have any closing remarks? 
Uh, just thank you for your support. And, uh, you know, you uh, members can co-author the bill. Uh, we are in session today. So just add on as a co-author on House File 2819. Uh, happy to support that. And I would uh, renew my motion that House File 2819 be recommended to be referred to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2819 be recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. The clerk will take the roll on the motion. All right. Uh, Chair Wozowick. Aye. Representative Hansen. Aye. Representative Heinzman. Aye. Representative Acomb. Aye. Representative Ackland. Representative Ackland. Aye. Representative Backer. Backer votes aye. Representative Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Eklund. Aye. Representative Fisher. Fisher, aye. Representative Green. No. Representative Igo. Igo votes aye. Representative Jordan. Jordan, aye. Representative Keeler. Keeler, aye. Representative Lee. Lee, aye. Representative Lippert. Lippert, aye. Representative Lewick. Lewick, aye. Representative Morrison. Morrison, aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. And Representative Tice? Tice, aye. All right. The vote is 18 aye, one nay. And with that, the motion prevails and the bill is on its way to the next committee stop. Um, and I will turn over the gavel slash puck back to Chair Hansen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, committee members. Thank you. Um, Representative Heinzman, would you like to move Representative Erdahl's bill to be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill, House File 2792? I would. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Heinzman moves. Uh, Representative Erdahl, to your bill. Welcome to the committee. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, glad to be here today. Uh, I have a quick and easy bill, I think, and I think nothing fishy about it or, at all. Uh, the <clears throat> Loose Line Trail uh, runs from uh, Plymouth to Cosmos. Uh, it's about 63 miles, uh, follows a former railroad grade, uh, and it passes within around five miles of Greenleaf Lake uh, Recreation Area in Meeker County, Southern Meeker County. And so uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, modify current statute to allow for a connection to Greenleaf Lake Recreation Area from the Loose Line Trail. Uh, this, I'm not asking in this bill that a trail be built, but uh, it can't even be given future consideration unless this uh, change is made. So that's all my bill does. And I believe we have a testifier from DNR Parks. Is that correct? Uh, they are available. Andrew Korsberg, DNR Parks and Trails Policy and Planning Supervisor. Welcome. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, for the record, uh, my name is Andrew Korsberg and I'm the Policy and Planning Supervisor for Parks and Trails. Uh, I'll just say, you know, DNR is supportive of this bill and this addition to the state trail system. The bill would authorize, uh, as uh, Representative Erdahl uh, shared, uh, a section of trail connecting the existing loose line state trail to the Greenleaf State Recreation Area. Um, changing the state trail authorizing statute is the first step in creating the trail and doing so will allow the DNR to take those first steps in establishing the trail, including a master plan. Um, uh, as he mentioned, the Loose Line State Trail currently runs 63 miles from Plymouth to Cosmos and travels through Hutchin Hutchinson. Uh, this trail connection will help extend uh, that the use of the of the loose line state trail by adding this uh, this destination as well as connecting the city of Hutchinson to the rec area by via a safe biking and walking trail. 
Uh, it's also you know, worth noting for, for everyone that um, this language is intended to be included in the DNR's policy and technical book this year. So uh, just in conclusion, this would be a nice addition to the loose line. And I want to thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for the chance to speak to it. Thank you. Members, are there any questions? Representative Acom. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members, and thank you, Representative Erdahl. I represent the, um, the, I guess, the east end of the Loose Line Trail in Plymouth. And um, I know that in our community, we are so grateful for the network of trails that we have, and it's an amenity that our community values greatly. And so I appreciate this effort, and um, I will be supporting it today. So thank you. Members, any other questions? Representative Erdahl, would you like to close? Uh, just thank you very much. Uh, appreciate uh, the support and uh, I look forward to uh, seeing Representative Ackham uh, bike out to, uh, to Greenleaf someday. I, I could meet her in Cedar Mills and do the last five miles. Thank you. Representative Heinzman, would you like to renew your motion? I would. Representative Heinzman renews his motion that House File 2792 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Members, just uh, looking ahead a little bit, we're done uh, ahead of time. Uh, we will be uh, next Tuesday having a Bowser Day. Uh, I anticipate quite a few testifiers uh, on that. Uh, the wetland mitigation bill, uh, Representative Sundin. Uh, CRP bill, and then uh, Representative Torkelson had a bill. So uh, I think that'll be a fairly full day. Uh, and then next Thursday, uh, we will have a lot of PFAS bills. So uh, Representative Wozlick has introduced a number of bills. I believe, uh, Vice Chair Wozlick, have those been introduced and are available for people to see? Yes, the ski wax, cookware, and cosmetics ones have all been introduced and are out there. And then I believe there's one more um, food disclosure that should be popping up pretty soon. Great. So if members have some questions or concerns, I'd encourage uh, uh, them to talk with Vice Chair Wozlick. Also on Tuesday, I'm, I forgot to mention the Outdoor Recreation Task Force report. I know there's going to be a bill coming, but we wanted to give uh, the opportunity for that report on Tuesday. And then uh, again, next Thursday, we had had uh, some discussion about the MLCAT. I think Representative Richardson will be having that bill uh, in front of us uh, with an amendment uh, potentially uh, um, clarifying some things. So, uh, and then we're into the third week uh, and we'll be looking at bills potentially coming from other committees uh, into our uh, jurisdiction. So uh, any questions, Representative Heinzman, do you have any questions? Uh, no, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. It sounds like we'll have a lot of new material this session. Looking forward to that. Hopefully not too many retreads. We've heard a number of those in years past, but I think that there's plenty on the agenda. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And members and Minnesotans, if bills have been heard already, we, they don't have to be heard, but they can still, they don't have to be heard again and can show up in an omnibus bill uh, uh, for uh, consideration on the floor. So I um, anticipate we'll be having a lot of very varied issues uh, coming in front of the committee uh, during the next few weeks. So thank you uh, and look forward to seeing you on the floor. We are adjourned. Thank you.